Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is AJ Ehrenstein. I'm the outreach coordinator for the MA Humanities program. See a lot of familiar faces in the crowd, which is awesome. Uh, I want to thank our panelists for being here today. My job is just uh, to introduce Jeff McMahon, who is our moderator. And to remind you just once, uh, when I imagine we'll have a lot of questions for this panel. I'll be coming around with this wireless mic. When you ask a question, if you could just speak directly into the mic, because it's going to be uh, filmed. Uh, so Jeff McMahon is a, probably a familiar face to a lot of you as well at MAF. Uh, we know him kind of as the Houdini of academic writing. Uh, he is also a journalist for Forbes.com where he covers green technology and just kind of the environment in general. Uh, he is a founding editor of Contrary Magazine, which often features the work of UChicago alumni, so hint, hint, somebody you should be pitching in the future. Uh, and he is also a lecturer here in the Committee on Creative Writing, uh, where he teaches classes on journalism, arts reviewing, travel writing, and pretty much everything. So I will hand it over to Jeff. Thanks again to our panelists, and hope you all enjoy. Thanks, AJ. I, I kind of feel like AJ should be on this panel, too, because he's sort of modeling a, um, a way to successfully and increasingly ambitiously be published. But thank you, thank you all for coming and for braving the storm to be here. I'm uh, just gonna introduce our panelists and then ask them a couple of questions and then we'll turn the questions over to you. First, Eugenia Williamson, Jeannie. She uh, is a graduate of math, I think it was 2006. That's right. And she's currently a staff writer at the Boston <coughs> Phoenix, um, a wonderful alternative paper in Boston, also website. And she's a contributing editor at the Baffler magazine. She, uh, I know you were also one of the math interns for the Brown and Miller Literary Agency, I interned right? actually at Brown and Miller as an undergrad. Oh, you did? Yeah. Okay. But a lot of people who intern there go yeah. on to do spectacular things, that's yeah, why I asked. Um, and next we have Hank Sarton. He's a senior editor at Time Out Chicago after serving for six years as the film editor. He has a PhD in film studies from U of C, 1998. He received that. And he wrote his dissertation on Warner Brothers cartoons. <laughs> he was also, he's, Hank is my predecessor. He was uh, the writing advisor uh, for math before me and also was a lecturer who taught journalism courses here. And then next we have Srikanth Reddy. Can we call you Chiku? Yeah. All right. Chiku Reddy is the author of two books of poetry, Facts for Visitors, published in 2004, and Voyager. And both of those uh, were published by the University of California Press. He has a new book coming out. It's a critical study, Changing Subjects, Digressions in Modern American Poetry. And it's uh, forthcoming from Oxford University Press. He's an assistant professor in the English department here at U of C. And along with Janice Knight, he's one of the leaders of our Committee on Creative Writing. And then at the end of the table, we have Ian Borland. Ian writes about books, um, I'm sorry, he's a scholar and an art critic who works on issues of globalization and contemporary art. And he's a math preceptor and a visiting professor uh, at the University of Illinois. Ian was a Rubenstein Fellow in Critical Studies at the Whitney Museum in 2011, and he's written for Art Forum, The Economist, The Chronicle of Higher Education, and other publications. So I'd like to get started by diving right into the topic that we're all wondering about, which is how you get started publishing. And you're all publishing in very different places and in very different ways. Um, so, whether it's freelancing or whether it's a regular staff position, if you could describe the path you took to get where you are. Starting with you, Jeannie. Um, well, I, I think the way you start publishing is to write for free. Um, <laughs> that's probably, uh, when I started writing, um, it, it was before I went to math, but um, I, uh, hooked up with a magazine that uh, no longer exists um, here in Chicago, and I was a um, writer in residence at Venus Zine, and I basically just wrote full time for six months and didn't get paid anything, but it gave me a ton of clips that I was able to parlay into bigger and better 
freelancing thing. So I, I, I think that ideally, if you could sort of get looped into writing for an editor um, that uh, can rely on you to provide good stuff that uh, they don't have to pay you for, then they'll start paying you eventually. So that's my advice. Um, I got started uh, writing for money partly because of my work in the PhD program. Um, somebody heard that there was this guy writing about cartoons uh, and was looking for an entertaining newspaper piece. Uh, and so I was actually approached um, to write something. The secret trick that I have from the 90s, and this sort of dates me, um, but I'm an old man so I don't care. Uh, the secret trick that I had was after the piece appeared in print, I sent a follow-up note saying, it was a pleasure working with you. I'm thrilled with the way it looks in print. Everything's fantastic. Um, if there are any opportunities in the future, I hope you'll think of me. Um, it turns out that I had already learned a couple of the tricks of how to get published on a regular basis. The tricks were, I wrote to the assignment. I wrote the number of words they asked for, not two and a half times the number of words they asked for, which, speaking as an editor of fair number of years now, I'll tell you, it's astonishing how often I say I need 600 words and somebody gives me 1,200 and says, it's a little bit long, feel free to cut what you need. No thanks. Um, so I wrote to length, I f filed on time, uh, and I filed text that I knew was good, clean copy that didn't need a lot of editing. Uh, I had taken it to, I think, four different people I knew and respected uh, with good eyes, <coughs> and they'd gone over the copy for me. And then the final trick was that I did, in fact, follow up and, and make the editor aware that I was available. Um, those tricks, I think, still work. Um, it's hard now to find, harder than it was at that time to find paid work, but uh, those tricks were essential for me. They asked me to do, do another piece, and a month after I'd done the second piece, and of course I did a follow-up note, it was such a pleasure seeing it in print, I had such a good time. Um, they called me and said, you know, we're actually looking for a film critic, and without even auditioning me, they put me on a weekly assignment. So for the second half of my graduate career, I was uh, a film critic for a weekly newspaper uh, every single week for five years. Um, that's not going to happen to you. <laughs> um, I can barely believe it happened to me. Uh, but the kind of other moral I would take from the story is um, I had an area of expertise that I was able to pitch, which started as being cartoons, but then I was able to say, well, you know, I'm getting a PhD in film studies. I kind of know about more than just you know, Bugs Bunny. Uh, and uh, that led to people trusting me as an expert in a field. Um, and all of my work since then has, has um, evolved by expanding that field of expertise so that, you know, eventually the Tribune came to me and said, would you write, uh, be interested in writing some book reviews? I did some book reviews for them. I hadn't written a book review before, but they had seen my writing and knew that I had some knowledge. And so the first book I did for them was a film-related book. Um, so think about where your knowledge base is and how that might be marketable. That would be a big piece of advice I would give. So. Yeah, I would, um, I would kind of underscore what uh, both Jeannie and Hank have said about getting your foot in the door uh, by, first of all, being willing to write for free and, uh, and writing well and on time for your editors. Um, now, I can speak less to making writing work for you, you know, in terms of profit uh, than other people on this panel because uh, I took about six years before I saw a royalty check for, you know, my, my poetry, my, my first book of poetry. Uh, there's just no money in it. Um, but I can say that uh, in, in trying to get your foot in the door as a literary writer, as a creative writer, uh, that what uh, Jeannie and Hank have said uh, still holds, uh, that it's very hard to place a story or a poem in the Paris Review or the New Yorker um, as, an un, as an unknown writer. And the way that you can get known uh, rather than 
trying to get your poems or short stories published uh, on their own merit, which is very hard because there are just such an enormous number of uh, submissions to these these periodicals uh, that even outstanding work just falls through the cracks all the time. Uh, one way of kind of getting around that problem is by uh, making a name for yourself as a reviewer. Uh, and this is what I did myself. Uh, I don't review very much anymore because I uh, now I'm able to publish poems and uh, things in magazines without having to do the reviewing part, but it was very important when I was starting out to uh, just make myself available to various editors of journals and magazines that I admired and respected and volunteering to take on whatever assignments they would uh, give me. Uh, you also, of course, you learn a lot about what's going on in con contemporary literary scene by doing that. Uh, you read writers you wouldn't ordinarily write when someone assigns you, uh, you know, a book of, uh, you know, uh, poetry by Jeffrey Hill or uh, by, some, you know, someone you'd never heard of before, which was the case for me. Uh, and then once you've written a certain number of these uh, reviews and get your name out there in that way, then it becomes a lot easier to publish uh, short stories or poems and, and, and uh, then, you know, let your career unfold from there. Echo and reframe. Basically, the consensus that's growing here. Um, uh, the first thing I would say is I'm I do more academic writing, and um, I was just getting the itch when I was uh, before I came back to Chicago and I was living in New York to have write things for an audience that people would actually read at some point. And so I didn't have any aspirations to make a living off of it uh, per se. I just wanted to reach a broader audience because academia can be a pretty lone wolf activity. And even if you're celebrated in your field, that might mean six people read your work. So um, that's a slight exaggeration, but you know, kind of true. Um, so I would say though, um, from the outset, it's it, you do have to write for free or write for very little. But I also would say, remember to know your worth and know the value of your time. And so be selective about who you write for free for. Um, the, you know, now I think I started writing on a freelance basis, and my wife was a freelance writer back in the days when you could get two dollars a word. Um, you know, and but that was also right before the crash. And now um, the media is changing. That doesn't mean that the media is not going to survive. It's just finding a way to monetize itself differently. There's less money for like, uh, a lot of humanistic writing, and there's a lot more competition for one reason because everyone has a blog now. And now everyone's curating a Tumblr feed, and that counts as some kind of valid criticism or review, and that's good, go democracy, but it's just, it's a more competitive marketplace out there. So if you're gonna, if someone's not gonna pay you or run you ragged and send you around town, or it's just, it's not gonna be useful to you, i.e. if it's not a publication you're going to work for, if it's not a publication in your field, if it's not a good set of editorial connections, maybe think twice about it, and maybe even yourself, you go the blog route and write compellingly, convincingly for a long time about something that you're good at, and that can serve as its own kind of clip, but little throwaway pieces all over the place that wear you out. Maybe not the best use of your free writing time, put it that way. Um, the second thing I would say is um, find a champion somewhere, um, that's, and that's just getting to know editors, um, being places. If you're gonna be a reviewer, be at all the shows, introduce yourself, don't be a sleaze, but be friendly, and uh, get to know people. And you know, editors get so many submissions, they get so many pitches. If, if you have a face-to-face -face relationship with someone and they grow to trust you, either through your writing or, just because you happen to have a chance to encounter at a, at a movie or a show or something, that's, that can be very helpful as well. And that's like just general important job advice. Um, and the third thing I would say is don't quit your day job and don't assume you're gonna be able to write for a living because it's kind of like saying I wanna be a major league baseball player. It's great if it happens to you and it's great to keep practicing and honing your craft, but um, you know, always make sure there's a fallback option. And if it grows into something else, you'll feel it growing and you'll be shedding other responsibilities and writing more and publishing more and that will start cascading. And, um, I was sort of last year, I, I, like half my income came from freelance writing, but that was came from a little germ. I, I had no idea that was going to happen, and so I've you know obviously do other things. So keep that in mind as well. It's it's competitive out there. I have a couple of follow up questions, which I think will lead into the next general question. The first one for Hank, you talked about when you first got that reviewing position at a weekly newspaper, writing reviews every week, and you said that's not going to happen to you. <laughs> Is that just because of probabilities, or is it because of changes in the economy? What do you think? Uh, I'd have to say it's a, a combination of factors. One that you're all familiar with, which is that um, the 
print world and particularly the world I was uh, originally introduced to uh, professional writing in was uh, free newspapers and the world of free newspapers is a very tough place <laughs> so, as Jeannie can attest um, free newspapers have had a really hard time Craigslist took away their personals business uh, the internet started generating other possibilities for content uh, there was competition from newspapers that were trying to get into some of their listings business more aggressively. Um, so the Boston Globe is trying to eat the Boston Phoenix listing lunch. Um, does, this, does this sound familiar? It does. Uh, and Time Out tried to hone in on the... And, time, and, then, and then Time Out unscrupulously came in and tried to, to launch a website for, for Boston as well. Um, those bastards. <laughs> um, I love you, Time Out. Um, <clears throat> so part of the, the situation is that the, the number of professional critics <coughs> in the arts in America uh, employed by newspapers and magazines has decreased, and this has been carefully documented actually, has decreased by something like 60 to 70 percent. The number of people working full time as critics in film, there was a guy who used to keep a website, I think it finally became too depressing for him, he had the film critic Death Watch. And, and he just would mark off all the people who had lost their jobs <coughs> and you know, keep reposting month after month for a period of about four years. Um, and we all used to go to that website and it was you know, sort of like visiting the cemetery. Um, so it's gotten hard. Um, you know, I'm thrilled that I landed in a full-time position. I don't know how the hell that happened. I landed at Time Out, but I have to say I had worked as a freelance critic because though I was a house critic for two different newspapers over a stretch of 10 years, in both cases I was earning very little money and weekly assignment is all good and well, but I, that was you know, a per piece payment. So um, the full-time job came to me you know, when I was 40 um, in, in, in journalism. Um, that's a long time. Um, now I had been a graduate student and then I became a professor and I was horsing around you know, doing Jeff's job here and doing a variety of things that sort of seasoned me and trained me to become a journalist and also uh, to work in a full-time kind of office environment, which is, has its own weirdness, by the way. Um, but those kinds of jobs are very rare and I think getting rarer. Um, a lot of publications are now turning to freelancers and paying them less because then we don't have to pay your health benefits. So that's a long answer. Thank you. So 60 to 70 percent decline in the number of film critics and yet now everybody's a film critic. Right, right. Which leads me to my follow-up question for Ian. You suggested that people develop a blog and blog about a certain subject, do it very well, do it for a long time. Yeah, How do you I, differentiate yourself from so many other people who are able to self-publish that way? Yeah, um, being really good at it, I guess. <laughs> but um, I, what I would say is uh, one thing I would have added before as well is you, particularly when you're starting, you have to have an angle because there are tens of thousands of really smart, really good writers out there and they will work for freelance wages and might be ahead of you in the queue, you know, whatever publication you want to write for. So uh, if you have an interesting angle, it can help tremendously. Like two, brief anecdotes. Um, I have a good friend who's a U of Chicago alum who's now the Wall Street Journal correspondent for all of West Africa. He did this by graduating from UFC, moving to Ethiopia, waiting for a war to break out and the editor to like run away basically and he took over this little paper in Addis Ababa and then he just stayed in Africa tenaciously. Um, so that's an extreme example but it's you know you, if you're just gonna sit in Hyde Park and hope that those plum assignments are gonna come to you they probably won't. Um, gone are the days where people are just gonna hand you a job for being brilliant. Um, so uh, from my perspective I, I uh, in New York writing art criticism is um, a lot of people do it. There's a lot of competition and part of it was leveraging the network of the school and then being persistent. I didn't have the clips at the time so I wrote selectively uh, for smaller art publications as a reviewer. Nothing consistent, just here and there. Um, but I did it really well. I focused on certain kinds of art. I focused on African art so that was an angle. Um, and then when I had that conversation again with that editor from Art Forum, they said, okay, well there's some substance here and I've seen your previous work on a specialized topic that I have a need for. So, um, similarly, my, my first break writing for The Economist, I just happened to be, in Af again, Africa's the theme here. I, I happened to be in Africa and I called the editor and I said, 
I have a pitch for you. You turn in all of my pitches, but I'm here in this place where you don't have the manpower to send people. It's really interesting. And he said, okay, write me 10,000 words. So, it, it, so some of it's chance, some, some, some of it's making your own luck by putting yourself in the right place. So when it comes to a blog, uh, I, I would say if you're going to have a public presence, I know we're in the Facebook generation, but if everything we do is going to be archived on the internet in perpetuity, um, maybe try to use your internet presence in a savvy way to establish yourself as a serious expert at something and to write um, considered thoughtful essays at about the right length, between 500 and 2,000 words that you might be writing. So show the people who are looking at your work that you're useful right out of the gates. Um, and you know, be professional, be serious, be good at one thing that you're really good at and that might be the hook that you need, particularly if you're choosing the right publications. Follow up on that. One of the things that you can do as a blogger that I think is essential is to think of yourself not as an island, but as part of a community of discourse. And one of the things that means is sometimes in your blog, and I imagine that you do this, one of the things that you can do is in your writing you can acknowledge with links that you're reading other people, and those links are something that you then alert them to, and they're aware that you're writing about them. They're paying attention to you as a result of the fact that you're mentioning them. Um, so you start a blog post and say, you know, um, saw a really interesting piece in, in, at Art Forum and, you know, it got me thinking about this. Let the person know at Art Forum because otherwise, you know, basically you're just whistling in the wind. But if you do that, you're reaching out and what you're doing is acknowledging that you're writing into a community of other people interested in the same topic who someday might be looking to hire somebody. Absolutely. So that th this is the perfect launching point for the next question for each of you. And then we'll um, go to audience questions. How has uh, the rise of digital publishing and the change in the economics of publishing affected each of you in two ways, in um, the way you market your work and in the way you write, if it has? Wow, that, <laughs> that, that's such an easy question. Um, <laughs> Um, in the way that I mark my work. I can speak to this from um, an editorial perspective. Um, I'm um, involved in the relaunch of the Baffler magazine, which if it weren't for the sort of, um, uh, what would you call it? Uh, because, you know, of the new digitization of stuff and iPads and longform.org and all that, I don't think that the Baffler would have a chance at relaunching. So um, I think that there is a new market for that. Um, I don't know how it's affected my own writing personally. Maybe it hasn't. I don't think it has. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna shut up. <laughs> um, I'll just start with an anecdote about word counts. Uh, when I started as a film critic in the early 90s, mid 90s, or 1993. Uh, my reviews were a thousand words to 1,200 words every week. Um, when I wrapped up as film editor about a year ago at Time Out Chicago, and I still occasionally write reviews, but now the reviews I'm writing are typically 225 words. Um, that's how digitization <laughs> has affected me. Uh, it's a kind of paradox that that the 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 web and, and technology has moved writing in two directions at once. There's now a new market for long, long form because the web is infinite space and you can continue typing until you die and still be on one blog post. Um, and some of them read that way uh, as though you died right in the middle. <laughs> but the pressure at magazines and newspapers uh, was towards shorter and shorter and has been historically over the last 20 years. So kind of a weird thing that happened. I went from 1,000 to 800 to 600 to 250 and then we started tightening that down to 225. Um, so how that's affected my writing? My God, I've become much more epigrammatic. Um, that would be my partial answer. That's a great answer. I think in academic publishing, which is where I do most of my, uh, well, which is where I do all of my publishing, um, the situation is different uh, because um, 
there's still a, a pretty strong um, hierarchization of print versus online uh, venues. I'll move this away from you a bit. Um, so that actually um, online, the, the explosion of online venues um, has had very little effect on my own writing. Uh, I'm mainly writing for people who are senior people in the field uh, who don't spend as much time online as younger people. Um, it's a kind of, you know, um, you're writing for people who are not of, of our historical moment in a way when you're in uh, academic uh, writing. Um, but uh, at the same time, in the world of poetry and uh, in literary, in the literary world, there is a great deal of, uh, there are a large number of online magazines now. Uh, and I get solicited for work by those frequently. And sadly, I actually have to say no most of the time, uh, partly because I can't generate as much material as you know, the kind of demand out there uh, that's created by all these new magazines uh, leads to. But also because um, in terms of building my professional portfolio, <laughs> Uh, it's actually not advantageous to, uh, as advantageous to have online publications. And that's something that I hope will start to change in uh, the academic world. I hope that online publications will be regarded on an equal status uh, with print publications. But still, right now, there's a kind of uh, academic prestige kind of accrues to print certain kinds of print venues more than online venues. Um, that's not to say that there aren't some adventurous um, and exciting uh, scholarly online journals starting up, uh, um, it, but it's really just starting up. Uh, and yeah, so I think I'll leave it at that. Chiku, is, do you feel the same way or differently about creative publications? Like the uh, <coughs> value placed yeah. on print versus online? <coughs> well, it's, you know, it's hard to, it depends on what your kind of like metric of like succeeding is in a way because there are a lot of people who publish a lot of stuff in online magazines and they're very happy about that and their name is out there and you can achieve some measure of literary fame <laughs> uh, by publishing online that you can't by pursuing the print uh, track. Uh, but the university, so if you, then if your employer is a university, they won't regard that as success uh, in the same way that publishing in certain on, uh, print venues is regarded as success. So it depends on if you just want to, who, who you're measuring, who's doing the measuring of, of that. But for example, uh, the poet Ron Silliman uh, has a blog that is probably the most widely read poetry blog out there. He's never held an academic position. Um, he lives in Philadelphia and works in uh, private enterprise and is one of the best known poets you know, uh, in the poetry world today, exclusively because of his online work. Uh, but I don't think he, but he can't get a job in a university. <laughs> And Ian, you may have already answered this one, but if you have any sort of uh, Yeah, I mean, the, the, the short version is, um, I, and I think this is speaking of generational shifts, right? I'm pretty young, and I, I feel like, for me, it just confirmed what was already happening, the, the fact that uh, any illusion I had of getting a full-time uh, journalistic uh, or you know, feature writing job, I just thought, I realized that's never going to happen, so get used to working many different jobs, uh, doing four or five things at all times, and always kind of be hustling. And the thing was, that I never had the illusion of anything else. This just confirmed it, the shift, because it happened right as I was coming of age into this field. Um, so on the other hand, it's, it makes things uh, kind of easy in its way, too. If, you're, if you need to be writing for a bunch of publications and you're traveling constantly, you can be in touch with editors quickly. You can send clips just as links, uh, which is great. Um, and then there are little tricks, too. I think, um, I think Hank's absolutely right. There's good old-fashioned manners with uh, the people. Even though it's digital, there's still real people on the other end. So connecting with people, sending them notes, acknowledging other people's work, super helpful. Um, and uh, get good at search engine, opti search engine optimization in the metadata. So if people are looking for other people's work, they might find your work accidentally. So there are little just digital tricks you can pick up on that way too. Okay, um, your questions now. And AJ has a microphone, so AJ, I'm gonna let you decide who gets it. So uh, 
just let us know if you have a question, raise your hand. And I, just, I also want to add one thing. Uh, this is kind of a, maybe a generational thing too, but get on Twitter. I really think this is important and it sucks for so many, and I've heard so many groans about this at UChicago about getting on Twitter, but often a managing editor at a publication won't have an email address, but they will have a Twitter feed, and it's totally acceptable for you to just message them and say, I've got something, I've got this useful content, Ian on usefulness was really good, like I've got something that's useful for your job. Do I have an opportunity to contribute to the publication that I read? Anyway, questions, anybody? <laughs> Um, so, I mean, you're talking about search engine optimization, these kinds of things, but I'm just kind of curious how far you go with that. I mean, to what degree do you optimize what you write for you know, technology? Um, are you talking about like encoding metadata? Or are you talking about in terms of specializing your writing? I'm, I'm yeah, specializing your writing, analyzing what works, what doesn't work. Just how far do you guys go with that? How much does that affect what you actually write? Um, I, what I'm hearing from you is a question about specialization. Um, I would say, I mean, in, I might be mishearing you, but what I'm getting from that is, uh, I would say specialize uh, and become an expert at something. And uh, like Hank said, he was really good at one thing, and that led to one thing, and then they realized he had a broader skill set, and then that expands, expands, expands. Um, so. Oh, so, sorry, let me just yeah. Things, uh, I'm really particularly asking about how much the performance of your pieces in terms of click-throughs and views and all those mm. kinds of things, looking yeah. at what leads to what, how much does that affect what you end up writing about? Yeah, I mean, being that um, analytic about it might suit some personality types. Not really my personality type, but um, I know people who really geek out on, on looking at their stats and actually tracking back where the stats come from, and a lot of blog platforms allow you to do that, or certain add-ons allow you to do that. Um, so just seeing what kind of what your your online juice is like is just useful, you know. Check in regularly, but if you're if you really want to geek out about it, you can. But that might also kill the the spirit of the thing. I think the bottom line is write quality first and be savvy, but don't don't try to trick anyone or game the system. I guess is the bottom line. So you know, do it do it just enough and no more. <laughs> you have to let, let your editor worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> is that what you were going to say? I was, uh, yeah. As your editor, let us worry about it. Um, you know, part of the game. Uh, Speaking from the publication side, um, not thinking as the person trying to get in the door, but being the person on the other side of the door, we do a lot of stuff online that's very much focused on the thought, this will get people to come to our website and stay. This is what we call sticky content. Um, some of that content, to me, feels sticky in a kind of different way, it's sort of like, you know, I'm not always proud when we have slideshow of 45 images of naked ladies reading books because there was an event in Chicago naked ladies reading books and we do 45 images and it's the number one hit on our website for the month does that mean that Time Out Chicago is going to become you know the film naked ladies reading scripts section no thank god uh, we're certainly conscious that that's something that drives traffic but we're also you know, very much aware, and in terms of what we're thinking about from writers, we are still trying to get quality writing that's smart, but also, you know, for us, it has the edgy, snappy, timeout voice. Um, but that doesn't mean, you know, you can smell something that's been sort of market analyzed, written, because um, it starts to sound to, to my ear, and I believe me, I read a lot of, of these. Um, emails that come from publicists trying to pitch a story idea to us and they'll say, you know, um, the hippest, hottest, happeningest thing in the city today is, you know, crocheting clubs. And, and th that crocheting club said has a dying fall. And you think, oh, really? Is it? And then I'll go to one of my editors and say, crocheting clubs, is that a thing? Is that a buzzy thing? Are we concerned about crocheting clubs? <laughs> and if we are, really? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so so if you if you want to drive yourself to the market just in terms of numbers, it can be very satisfying <coughs> if you do all slideshows of naked ladies reading books all the time. You're probably going to get a lot of hits, uh, but what that's going to do for you in terms of getting jobs, it's a little different story. So. More questions? I kind of have a question about maybe some advice you guys might have on best practices in terms of kind of not exhausting yourself too much to kind of stay in it for the long run. Um, is it something better to do shorter quality pieces every day or maybe one long quality piece each week? Is there anything you guys have an opinion about on that? 
um, depending on well, when uh, I, I didn't have a full time um, writing job um, for five years after I got out of math, um, and in that time I um, I tempt at a very easy. Um, very lucrative, actually, uh, hilariously, it's, it pays more than I make as a journalist now, <laughs> but <laughs> for a, a real estate uh, mega conglomerate downtown here. And um, I, I think that not exhausting yourself is important, and I think that if you have like a basically a brain dead job, I think that was invaluable in, in, uh, in sort of uh, freelancing. I don't know if people can still temp. How is the economy doing? I, I, look, I look to the... Temping's hot. Temping's hot? Yeah. You can still temp. <laughs> awesome. Is it as hot as crochet clubs? Nobody knows. Um, and naked ladies. <laughs> and naked ladies. Greeting. Naked ladies stumping. But um, <laughs> don't don't if, if you're if you're writing, let's say you're temping and writing for free, which is something that I, I did, and that you know and, until I started getting paid while I was temping. But um, I think that uh, writing fewer quality pieces for somebody who's regularly expecting them is probably the best course of action because then you know. If, if your writing's dissipated, you don't really, I mean, it's not the, the quantity of the cl clips, it's the quality of the clips, I guess. <laughs> but, I, but I would advise, think about a schedule. If people, if people are going to your blog and you're writing steadily, if, if we're just talking about blogs, in terms of a blog, I want to be able to know confidently that if I go on Friday morning, there's going to be something new. And this is something that has proven true very widely across the field is people love predictability in their in their web searches um, in terms of the idea that they're going to revisit um, that's been a huge traffic route for us we are at work with our editors right now working out ways that they will have blog posts that go on specific days of the week so that we can have the Wednesday film forum right um, because it rolls so trippingly off the tongue so that's an important idea is short or long there ought to be some kind of predictable rhythm. And I think, I think uh, your point about uh, being selective uh, is very, very important also. Um, while it's hard to make money um, as a film reviewer um, uh, today, uh, it, is, uh, it is very uh, easy to find uh, opportunities to write literary reviews, not for money, <laughs> but with uh, quite prestigious uh, journals. The Harvard Review is always looking for reviewers who will write for free, but uh, will write on time uh, and well-written reviews. Uh, and they'll pub you know, they publish them on their online uh, yeah, um, wing of the magazine. Uh, the Chicago Review here at the university is always looking for literary re reviewers who will get the work done on time. Uh, and so you can build up a portfolio that way uh, that um, if you choose the venues carefully and you uh, establish a relationship, uh, can pay off in the long run. Hi, I'm thinking of starting a blog about something I'm becoming expert in. And um, a lot of uh, bloggers that I really admire, um, they've um, some of them write for like newspapers, or they have, I guess they have a position. Others have independent sites, and I've noticed that some of them start um, to advertise on their site, um, ask for donations. Even some of their entries are about asking for donations so they can travel. And these are the enormously successful sites that even government and people, consultants, and lots of NGOs look at and consider. You know, some of them are professors. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on this, because there is kind of, when I saw that, uh, there was this kind of feeling like, you know, is this, I mean, on the one hand, people need to eat, and they, obviously, if this person could earn money, maybe they could do this more independent. Obviously, they're so passionate about it. Um, they can care about this so much that they're not like, doing this um, for profit. But I'm just wondering what your thoughts about it are, because I had some sort of morally, ethically ambivalent feelings about it. And I don't know if you felt the same and what your stance on, on that is normatively. Uh, is there an ethicist in the room? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, this could actually be an interesting discussion. My feeling generally is uh, you know, ads and tickers and donating people for money, that's just kind of like low class, it, particularly in the beginning. You want to be professional <laughs> and project confidence. 
Um, but on the other hand, it's like we've all heard those NPR pledge drives, and their argument is we give you free radio, but it's not free. Journalism can't be free, um, particularly good journalism, and that's going to be a big problem in the next coming decade, if not already, right? But that said, uh, NPR offers a great product. I mean, it's worth every penny you donate to them. So their model is, yeah, donate to us so we can keep giving you this free product. And if there are those amazing blogs out there that people are doing, like this poetry blog, that are fantastic, and they're dedicating a lot of, they have an opportunity cost with their other professional opportunities, and they're providing a genuine service and to a genuine audience, sure, ask for money. Ask for a Kickstarter to self-publish something. Fine, but you really have to, you can't put the cart before the horse. That's be my first pass on that anyway. Any other? That's why most blogs die, probably. <laughs> Hi. Um, I had a question about what you said about if you're starting a blog or writing a blog, referencing other bloggers in the community. I think that my inclination would be if I was starting a blog to kind of post reviews and get my voice out there. I don't know that my first instinct would to be, be to include or reference other people's reviews of the same show. I mean, how important do you think it is to try to either work that into your review or, I don't know, maybe add kind of a, another good review of this show, you know, link, I... I would actually draw a distinction in terms of blogging between the review that you write and a blog post that you do that's a more conversational piece. I would, I would encourage, if you're thinking about uh, a blog that's primarily going to have an arts reviewing function, that you have two distinct kinds of posts and you ought to design the site in such a way that people can navigate reviews only, um, but that you have reviews and, that's, and they are freestanding. I, I, after many years in film criticism, I always found the most insufferable kind of review was one that referred to other reviews. Pauline Kael said that, blah, blah, blah. Well, Pauline, I have a bone to pick with you. Just <laughs> go away. <laughs> it just, that starts sounding t to any reading audience beyond a bunch of nerd critics, and believe me, we're all nerds, um, like horribly inside baseball, like people, just this tiny little group arguing at each other, which is way too much like academia. <laughs> You know, I've been waiting all day to get my shots in, right? I, I'm a recovering academic, and I'm proud of it. But if you also, on a blog, are engaged in the idea of conversation, separate from reviewing, I think that can serve an interesting function, which is community formation. What I know of bloggers I know in the film world, they do just that. So their reviews, whether they get placed with a newspaper or a magazine, they'll, you know, put a link on their blog, but then they'll also have just, you know, I've been reading around and you know, something weird happened. All the reviews of Bridesmaids have this odd pattern where they all, you know, like have to say something about the actress being fat and, you know, like, so they'll come to something and say, this is a conversational piece, not a review. That distinction is important, but you're still forming community. So that's, that's how I would see it. Um, I, don't, I don't like reviews that talk about other reviews. That's just me. We have time for uh, one or two more questions. Um, this question is probably mostly for Hank, but um, I was just wondering to what extent it's easy or difficult to parlay other print publication experience into writing, like marketing or sales or advertising experience for a print publication. It's a good question. Um, there's a lot of movement back and forth, but here's the, the story I would tell you is most of the movement is from journalism into marketing rather than the other way around because people who are trained to write marketing tend to have developed bad habits about reporting and about their, their writing tends to get a very promotional, positive, buzzy sound to it um, that we're we are distrustful of on the other side of the fence. Um, there aren't, I can't think of a lot of people who've come from marketing into journalism, um, but I can think of a lot of journalists who've gone over into marketing. Um, so I would, I would say that 
that's maybe not a good path to, to move down. Um, obviously, if you can keep those identities separate and you work for a marketing firm during the day and they pay you lots of money and at night you're like, you know, Batman and you're <laughs> blogging away brilliantly about, about you know, um, the theater scene, more power to you. Um, but the marketing writing, I, I find, just doesn't, it doesn't translate well. Uh, so I sort of have a question about reviews. I can stand up since I'm back here. Um, I've done a little bit of like blogging reviews, and uh, personally, I'm sort of theoretically and philosophically against giving, you know, four out of five stars. That sort of very uh, quick review thing is that something that I might have to do sometimes if I'm getting into reviewing more professionally, or is that something that you can try to avoid? Um, in your choice of who to apply to and that sort of thing? Um, or is it, is it too limiting to try and do that? Well, that certainly never comes up in book reviews, so that's good. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so write book reviews. <laughs> yeah, that's a weird thing, yeah. isn't it? That <laughs> it might start. Depend, depends, yeah. I mean, if you're going to be a film critic, you're stuck with it. Um, we all are. We, when I started at Time Out, we didn't use stars for the first, I don't know, few months. Uh, and then the dictate came down from London from the people who at that time owned Time Out Chicago. They said, we're all going to the star system. <laughs> and it was made more eccentric by the fact that in London they used a six star system, uh, <laughs> which completely confused everyone in America because we'd give something four stars and say, you know, it's pretty good. And, and there'd be these ads that would appear, four stars from Time Out Chicago. Oh God, here we go. <laughs> Uh, but there are certain fields where stars have really just sort of taken over the business. Um, it's unfortunate, uh, and I'm you know proud of the holdouts. The place you know it's great that the New Yorker doesn't do stars. But um, on the other hand, you know, depending on how aggressively you want to move into a market of of regular publication, stars are a part of that business. Except yep. in books. Except in books. Um, yeah, I would also say if it's your personal blog, uh, part of the reason stars have an authority is because there's an institution behind, or someone has a career. Sis, you know, the Cisco Niebuhr thumbs up thing, that's because they were noted critics for a long time. But as, uh, as Hank mentioned, people like David Denby or Anthony Lane, you take them or leave them. One thing that's great about their writing is they never say that there's, I liked it outright, or I didn't like it, or it gets this many stars. They make an argument. So I, what it really, I think when you're starting out, a star system is irrelevant for your own individual practice. Second, you need to think about what your actual critical practice is. Or do you want to be a reviewer giving your opinion, or do you, are you actually being a critic, making an argument, doing something additive to the piece of culture you're engaging? And if that's the case, maybe the work you can be doing now is finding ways to convey that point without recourse to something so literal or graphic. We are just about out of time, so I want to say thank you to our panelists.